All right, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Speak the Truth podcast. I am your host, Matt Tardio, and this video is being sponsored by Groove Life. Today, we're going to be going over Iran and their role in this entire conflict in the Middle East, because truthfully, it's expanding right now beyond what's happening in the Gaza Strip to Lebanon, to Yemen, to Iraq, and into Syria. And all of this comes on the wake of a terror attack that took place inside of Iran. Now, I do think it is a bit ironic that the world's largest state sponsor of terror got attacked by ISIS. I mean, wrap your head around that one for a little bit. But nevertheless, ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack, or so it would seem. And we're going to talk about that today because it's very possible that this could be a false flag agenda. Now, the reason I bring that up is because most wars throughout time, I mean, how many times have we seen false flags happen when it comes to conflict? Now, I am not a huge conspiracy theorist. I don't subscribe to many conspiracy theories at all. And I'm not here trying to push and tell you this is a conspiracy theory. What I'm here trying to tell you is that right now, Iran has a very good excuse for directly getting involved in this conflict. Now, We're going to talk about a couple things over the portion of this episode. We're going to talk about the Houthis. We're going to talk about Iraq. We're going to talk about Hezbollah. And of course, Hamas is going to come into play. But mainly we're focusing on Iran because what we're seeing right now is all of the sponsors, everybody that Iran has been sponsoring is currently under attack across the Middle East. Now, put your mind in the Iranian shoes. If the Iranians have invested all of this money into Hamas, all of this money into Hezbollah, and all of this money into the Houthis, And right now, they're all about to get wiped out or at least severely diminished. Wouldn't it be in Iran's best interest to do something about it? Now, Iran, while they are the largest state sponsor of terror in the world, and they are pushing this agenda to the Houthis, to the Hamas, to Hezbollah, while they are doing that, they don't want to overtly come out and do it because it looks bad for them on the world stage. Nor do they want to overtly come out and start defending them when Israel goes into Lebanon and starts attacking Hezbollah. It would look really bad if Iran just stood up and said, you know what, we're going to go after Hezbollah. We're going to go defend Hezbollah. It would look really bad for them if they just went right in and defended Hezbollah, unless they had an excuse. Let's talk about it. Because just today, just today, Iran decided that they were going to raise their coveted red flag. Take a look. Now, this red flag that you currently see on your screen, okay, is the red flag of revenge for Iran. They've only flown this thing five times in Iran's history, and those involved in the terror attack in Kerman now know it awaits them. That's what they're saying. Iran's pretty serious, but even though ISIS claimed responsibility for this attack, inside of Iran that currently the death toll is fluctuating, but somewhere between, I don't know, 84 to a hundred. I've seen numbers a little bit higher than a hundred. I think they're still trying to grasp how many people have actually been lost in this. Okay. However, ISIS claimed responsibility. Now there are some things in ISIS's statement that don't quite add up historically to how ISIS does things. Further, there's some information between what ISIS put out and what Iran is putting out to how this attack actually went down. Also, if ISIS is claiming responsibility for the attack, why is Iran blaming the United States and Israel for pushing them to do it? We're going to get into all that, and I think you're going to your your mind might explode a little bit at some of the implications that this could 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 happen. What what could actually happen and come out of this is we could very possibly get sucked in to another war. So this is ISIS's uh, uh, still shot of ISIS's video where they claim responsibility for the attack inside of Iran. Now, this came out on Thursday, and I want to do things chronologically, but I'm going to start off here on this post because there's some key things I want to point out inside of it. Okay, number one, we have their faces that are blurred out. This is a first for ISIS. Normally, they don't do that. Normally, when ISIS puts a video out, they wear their masks, but they don't blur their faces. The reason I'm bringing this up when we look at it Okay, is because if you guys remember Jihadi John, now terrorist organizations do have the ability to fluctuate and go back and forth. Okay, they can change their TTPs. Right now we're seeing Hamas blur videos out, okay? But this is a first for ISIS right here where they ended up blurring their faces out. But this is the video, this is a still from the video of where they claim responsibility for the attack. Now, immediately following the attack, within a few hours, immediately is a stretch, but within a few hours, the United States government came out and they said ISIS could have carried out the bombing inside of Iran. 
Here's your new source on it. Okay, this comes from the Hill. They're a pretty reputable source for the most part. The U.S. designated terror groups ISIS could have carried out the deadly bombings in Iran on Wednesday that killed more than 100 people, according to a senior U.S. military official. It does look like a terrorist attack, the type of things we've seen ISIS do in the past, the official said. As And as far as we are aware, that's our ongoing assumption at the moment. So U.S. officials had assumed at the time that ISIS did carry out this attack. Now, yesterday... ISIS had came out and claimed responsibility. In that screenshot of the video I just showed you, ISIS claims responsibility for the attack. Now, interesting enough, afterwards, all right, Iran comes out and they end up blaming the United States and Israel for the blast. Now, if we scroll down in this article and we take a look, there's a key piece that I want to point out for you. It's right here in the middle. I just had it highlighted. The Iranian news agency quoted what it called informed sources. They said that, quote, Two bags carrying bombs went off. I want you to remember that. And the perpetrators apparently detonated the bombs by remote control. Remember that of what happened. Now, as we look through this article and we go back a little bit, this is what I'm talking about where they don't quite have the figures down. Uh, right here it says 84 so far, uh, 284 people have been injured, 195 hospitals. It was a big deal. And there's a video going around that actually shows like the bomb going off and a little bit of the aftermath. We're not going to get into that because truthfully, I just want to stick to some of the information that's within this video right now. Here is the Islamic State. Here's your article from Reuters showing the Islamic State claim responsibility for the attack. Tehran vows revenge, thus the red flag. But how do we get from the line of ISIS? How do we get to that, that line between ISIS declaring it and then Tehran blaming the United States and Israel and vowing revenge? Good question. And I think to answer that question, we have to get into the overall geopolitics of the area and what's going on. So for those of you that are not aware, the United States government, the White House in particular, put out a memorandum the other day that, that said, Houthis, we're not putting up with your crap anymore. We're going to come after you. And it was repeated today by US CENTCOM. US CENTCOM actually tweeted out the same thing from the White House, letting the Houthis know we are not going to put up if you don't stop. And the Houthi, the Houthi rebels, they already answered back. And they said, look, we don't care. So inevitably, the Houthis are going to start attacking more merchant vessels and the U.S. and the international coalition that's put together to protect the Red Sea is going to respond. And they're likely to hit them on mainland Yemen. Now, the Houthis are a big deal within themselves. Some of you who have been following this channel before have seen this. What I've just put up on your screen is a picture of Yemen where the Houthis currently work. Now, to orient you a little bit, right down over here where it says Macha, everything over here in the Southern Red Sea, this is mainly where those ship attacks from the Houthi rebels have been taking place. Now, everything in red that you see is Houthi-controlled territory, everything in red. So it makes sense that they're able to project and target vessels within the Red Sea, okay? Now, everything in red, like I said, is Houthi-controlled territory, but the interesting part when we look at it is that's also the most densely populated area inside of Yemen, so the Houthi rebels control the vast majority of the population inside Yemen. The darker the color gets, the more densely populated the area go. The internationally recognized government, as far as I'm concerned, effectively controls sand and a small chunk of the population. Again, let's go back. Houthi-controlled area, population density. Houthi-controlled area, population density. Now, the interesting part about the Houthis is they are a terror organization and they are backed by Iran and they're funded quite well. Not to mention when they started taking this terrain back, they were able to acquire a bunch of the military, uh, military equipment that was left behind. Thus, they have sophisticated equipment that they're able to target these ships out in the Red Sea. And this is Iran's investment on the area. This is Iran's projection on the area. And right now, as we speak, the United States government is plotting to start bombing the crap out of these dudes harming Iran's investment. Okay, no big deal, you say. Well, Iran's other big investment is Hamas. U.S. State Department estimates that over $200 million a year as of 2020, like Iran was providing to Hamas. So again, that's a lot of money that's going in there to support that organization, which is currently being crushed by Israel, which now leaves Hezbollah and the Houthis left for Iran to sponsor. Obviously, they sponsor some other people, but... There are large ones in that area, Hezbollah and the Houthis. Now, the Houthis are about to get wiped out, so that leaves Hezbollah. Well, what do we know about what's about to take place over inside Israel? I just spoke to a man uh, that's you know retired from the IDF, and again, it can be confirmed when we start looking at other things online. The border in between Israel and Lebanon 
has pretty much been cleared out. The IDF evacuated their people, and on the northern side of the border, inside of uh, Lebanon, a lot of the civilian population has been displaced. They said around 150,000 people on both sides of that border have been displaced due to the fighting and the idea that there's about to be more fighting coming up. And there is a rumor circulating around the IDF that Israel is about to go into Lebanon. Last month, it got leaked that the date that the IDF had set for this invasion was on January 4th. Now, obviously, that passed yesterday. And Israel is going, if they did intend, they're still going to do it. They're just going to do it at a later date. Now, right now, the IDF all right, has troops, the reserve troops that they just took off duty, and they're going to bring them back um, every, every couple months for 30 days to keep them fresh. They're going to rotate to them with the front lines. But Israel has pulled out several brigades of combat troops from the Gaza Strip to give them a little bit of rest and relaxation. Also, a lot of the fighting inside of the Gaza Strip has slowed down because Israel has taken over a large chunk of it. They control about 90, 90 plus percent of Gaza City, and they're about halfway through Khan Yunus over in the south, which is the second most populated area, and a Hamas stronghold. So that means they have a bunch of troops that are left in reserve and military equipment has been being moved up to the Lebanese border by the IDF in preparation, we believe, for an inevitable invasion. So that leads me to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is by far the most powerful terror organization on the planet. They have the numbers, they have the equipment. I outlined it just a couple days ago. All right, they have drones that are, they have short, long, and medium range drones. Some of those drones are capable of traveling 2,400 kilometers and carrying precision guided munitions. And they have them. And where did they get them from? They got them from Syria. When Syria and Assad were having issues, which they still are, by the way, they called on Hezbollah to help them out. And in return for Hezbollah's help, they asked for weaponry. And oh, did Hezbollah get the weapons from Syria. Now, with all of that being said, the other big concern, and Israel's complaint about it, and I talked about it over the last couple of days, Hezbollah very likely has chemical weapons as well. Those chemical weapons, guess where they came from? Syria. And who are they working with in conjunction? That would be the IRGC at the SERS facility. Now, all this is documented, and it's all been passed along, and Israel even believes that Hezbollah currently has them. The soldier I talked to told me back in 2002 when they were preparing to go in as I, you know, the U S was getting ready to go into fricking Iraq, that they were being issued gas masks because back then they even believed that Hezbollah had chemical weapons. And now they have just grown and become more and more powerful. Now I do believe if you're in the United States and you're legally allowed to do so, you should be carrying a firearm for personal protection and self-defense of both your family and your loved one. And that's how I actually discovered Groove Life and got into using them. I started off with their belt. Their belt is super comfortable. I'm going to get into that in just a sec. But first, I'm going to tell you about your wallet that they just came out with that I absolutely love, the Groove Life wallet. Now, the Groove Life wallet is sleek. All right, it's low profile and it's engineered for everyday use. With one simple thumb motion, you can perfectly fan out up to six cards. Check that out. Bam, just like that. Kicks your card out. Now, obviously, I took mine out and I put in the little insert that it comes with because a lot of you guys, you like to steal my stuff. You guys, have, you know, you're kind of shady sometimes, but I love you guys for it. But this wallet is absolutely fantastic. It gives you easy access for everything that you need. It's durable, high quality, aluminum outer shell. All right, the wallet's unlike anything that I have ever seen. Plus, Groove Life just launched their new carbon fiber wallet, which is everything you love about the original Groove wallet, but with added carbon fiber protection included. Not to mention anything that happens to your Groove Life gear, they're there to help with Groove Life's 94 year no BS warranty. The Groove Life wallet is the last wallet you will ever need. Now, I love the Groove Life wallet because it's very simple. It keeps all of your cards condensed in one tiny little space. It's even got a pocket clip. You can push it up. Card comes right out. Easy access to everything. Also, I love the freaking Groove Life belt. Like I said, this is where I started and this is why I love these guys. I got to rip it off because I got to bring it up. And again, I took off my EDC, but the Groove Life belt, the reason I love this dang thing, okay, the reason I love it in conjunction with my freaking EDC pistol that I carry is because the belt actually has a little bit of give to it, okay? See that little bit of give? That way, when I sit down inside of a vehicle or I sit down inside of my car with my pistol attached, all of a sudden it stretches and it goes out and it works great. I use it all the time. I love it for that function. I have some pretty expensive belts that I love to carry. I love that and this freaking wallet. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 2024. And if you are still using the same wallet from 2004, now's the time to upgrade your wallet with 
Groove Life. Head over to GrooveLife.com slash Rob for 20% off all Groove Life products. That is the best offer you will find, but you will have to use my link, GrooveLife.com slash Rob for 20% off your order. One last time, that is GrooveLife.com slash Rob for 20% off your order. Again, I'd like to thank Groove Life for sponsoring this video and giving me such great products that make my life easier and more comfortable. Now let's start looking at some of these statements between what ISIS said and what Iran said. Now go back in time. Remember how I told you, remember how I told you that Iran thinks that they were remote detonated IEDs. That's what Iran thinks. You know what ISIS said? ISIS said that they were suicide belts. Now that might not seem like a big deal to you. Okay, but it goes to show some inconsistency of what's going on. I've done post-blast analysis, and I can tell you that there is a huge difference between a suicide belt and a remote detonated IED. The way it looks is totally different. The, the, the way the damage, everything on the ground, the bodies, it's different. They would know. They would definitely know. And Iran, being the largest state sponsor of terror and used to doing stuff like this on their own, believe me, they know. And so I find it highly improbable that they would do that. Now, when we look at that and we couple that with this video that ISIS released, where they're stating that it was an SVS or a suicide belt that ended up being set off or two different ones that ended up being set off. Then you add in the blurred faces. All of that is very suspect, but there's something else that was very suspect about this video. Now, ISIS, you got to understand their ideology. They are radical Islamists, like the farthest of the farthest radical Islam that you can ever think of. All right, and because of that, they don't call Iran, Iran. What they actually call it is either the Persian province or the Khorasan. And the reason they do that, look at ISIS-K, ISIS Khorasan, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria dash Khorasan, ISIS-K. The reason they do that goes back to their like ideology. Now in this video, they use the word Iran. They didn't use Persian province. They didn't use Khorasan province. So now we have a couple things wrong. We have them defining it as Iran and not within their ideological beliefs. Then we have faces blurred out, which they've never done before, but hey, they're allowed to do it. And then we have Iran saying that uh, it was it was placed remote operated IEDs versus suicide belts. Now those things combined actually started to make me think, why would this happen? And oh, by the way, the timing in which ISIS put out this claim, now they put out claims a day late before, but most of the time, they start off with their rhetoric and then they go into their actions and then they post their freaking video for why they did it, claiming responsibility for it within a relatively short period of time. And we didn't get that in this. It was just a random attack that popped off. And so now I'm questioning myself whether or not ISIS actually did this. Now, the question that I, I, I cannot seem to answer to myself, if I look at this and I say this is a false flag attack, that Iran did this, why would Iran do it? Well, they do have motivation. Okay, they have motivation because they need some grounds to protect their freaking investments over time. That being Hezbollah and that being the Houthis, because Hamas at this point is a lost cause. So they need to they need to defend those guys. Now, if Israel was to attack yesterday and go or a couple days ago before this went down, if Israel attacked when they were supposed to go down. Iran really wouldn't have a good reason on the world stage to go after Israel or to go after the United States. Same thing with the Houthis. However, comma, when we go back, they didn't just blame ISIS, they blamed the U.S. and Israel. Now, that gives them a decent excuse, at least in their crooked minds on the world stage, to go and attack the U.S. and Israel and defend Hezbollah and defend the Houthis and to fund them more openly on an open stage. You see, the way terrorism progresses, it goes from being underground to being overt very quickly. Eventually, they build everything up, and I'm not making this stuff up. You can check out U.S. war doctrine when it goes to terrorism. You start off doing underground and covert operations, such as funding these militaries, and then you step up and you start doing overt actions. Now, Iran's interesting because they're a terrorist nation. They're a terrorist state. They sponsor terrorism around the, around the world, particularly in the Middle East. And they do it in a clandestine manner that they don't want other people to know about. IRGC has been operating in Syria, working closely with Hezbollah. So in order for them to come on the world stage and be like, these are now our people, they need an excuse to do it. Now, that's one plausible explanation that allows them to go in and do that. Another plausible explanation that people like to dive into when you look at all these inconsistencies is the fact that the United States government came out and said, no, hey, it was ISIS. ISIS did this. Why would the U.S. government do that? 
Well, because they know that Iran would have an excuse then to go in and start attacking and draw us into a, a, another conflict and feed the military industrial complex. Now, again, I understand that everything I just stated is all a giant tinfoil hat moment, but it is very important when I bring this up because the United States has a ton of troops over there right now in, in the strike carrier groups floating around the Med, inside Jordan, inside Iraq, inside Syria. They're everywhere. We have U.S. troops, and they are all prepared and ready to go. At the moment Iran strikes U.S. forces openly or goes and attacks Israel, the United States will step in. But the scarier part is that Hezbollah has chemical weapons. Israel claims it. There's very good evidence to support it. There's no doubt in Israel's mind that Hezbollah has chemical weapons. Now, if Hezbollah uses chemical weapons against the IDF when they go in, that's going to cause an international uproar. And again, it's another excuse for the United States to get involved. And who do you think is going to come to Hezbollah's rescue when the West gets pissed off that the largest terrorist organization is using chemical weapons against a nation? Iran. Again, having an excuse to step up and do these things. Now, I'm telling you guys this. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that if something like this pops off, it didn't just happen overnight. I've given you a warning about it. I could be 100% wrong, and you can tell me I'm wrong all you want. I don't care. Tell me how wrong I am. But also, you have to understand the validity that goes into some of this stuff. Here's another example I just put up on your screen of Iranian-sponsored terrorism inside of Iraq. This just got posted by CENTCOM today. On January 3rd, Iraqi police in Babylon discovered a land attack cruise missile of Iranian design that failed to launch. The use of Iranian-supplied munitions by terrorist groups within Iraq and Syria endangered coalition forces and local residents. The coalition is appreciative of the efforts in the legitimate security forces of Iraq for their efforts to prevent future attacks. I want you to take a look at this thing. This is not a mortar. This is not an RPG. This is a sophisticated piece of equipment. Look at the freaking launcher that's set up for this thing to go off of. Again, this is not something that your average jihadi is going to be setting up and using. This is an example of that state-sponsored terror that we're talking about coming from Iran. And again, let's go back. Iran raised the red flag. It's up on top of their mosque. They're going to do something. The question is, what are they going to do? Now, they could wait for a pop-off point. They could wait for the United States to attack the Houthis. They could wait for Israel to go in and inv invade Lebanon and go after Hezbollah. Or they could launch a preemptive strike. All of these things are well within the realm of possibilities. You also have to remember that they have sleeper cells all around the world. They could easily activate one of them. And then again, come out and be overt because they've been covert about a lot of the things that they're doing. Now they can step up to their overt stage and they could say, look, U.S., you are now strike us in our homeland with this ISIS attack. So we're coming after you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a problem. This right here is what could very potentially spark the next world war. North Korea today is acting up. China is acting up. And of course, Russia is still peddling around inside of Ukraine and they're not backing out. The world's falling apart right in front of your very eyes. And the U.S. needs to do something about it. And we need a strong administration to do something about it. I hope you guys liked today's episode. I am your host, Matt Tardio. Again, I want to thank Groove Life for sponsoring. And if you guys didn't know, we also opened up some merch. So go get yourself some merch if you'd like. It's in the video description down below as well. Until next time, think about this. Peace, love, happiness, and God bless.